We're going to keep this tight throughout the program. And we'll also consider the Oilers game that starts at 6. <laughs> Tom, do we have an enemy in the house? <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome Minister Sigurdsson, AEG members and guests. A special thank you to Heather that worked so hard to organize it all, to Julia and Bob that made the magic happen, so thank you. I'm Catherine Brownlee, President of Alberta Enterprise Group, a business advocacy organization established in 2007 by a group of visionary business leaders. Speaking of the Oilers, it was a lot of the owners. Um, our mission is to transform Alberta into a thriving hub for both living and conducting business, ensuring prosperity for every Albertan. With over 150,000 employed Albertans among our members, we have significant presence in communities of all sizes throughout the province. Our collective economic impact amounts to billions of dollars annually, actively stimulating and shaping the business landscape for the benefit of all. At AEG, we are dedicated to serving our members through effective advocacy and defense. We have a proven track record of success, and in a moment, you'll hear from our member and senior advisor, Shondell Sabad, who will give us a general overview of our advocacy activities. Additionally, we have helped raise substantial funds to establish an energy literacy program in 450 schools and trade charter schools across the province. Membership with AEG brings numerous benefits, including participation in trade missions, regular networking events, member spotlight features, and access to AEG health benefits through our partner ICBA. If you're not yet a member and are interested in learning more, feel free to contact us anytime. Shondell's available seven days a week. <laughs> 24-7. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Today has been made possible by our sponsors and supporters. Platinum sponsors our friends at County of Grand Prairie and Prairie Vertical Farms. Diamond sponsor, Access Tribe, which is a blockchain Bitcoin organization run by females, which is interesting. Gold sponsor is Teamwork Consulting. Silver sponsors is Rainforest Energy, which is a biomass production organization that Shondell is president of, and he had a tour of the biomass facility today, so thank you to the county for arranging that. Uh, and then our dear ta our team, I'm not sure if the team side is up yet. Have to do that. Like a oh, you got the clicker there. <laughs> oh. Awesome. And there's, there's our team. Uh, it's, it's an army to, to make it all happen. It's, um, it's a lot to carry, and we, we enjoy it. So thank you all to everyone who supported and to our sponsors. As mentioned, Shondell will now present her advocacy efforts. Shondell? Oh. There we go. Ah, that's how I got it. Alrighty, thanks Catherine. As Catherine mentioned, I'm uh, filling in for advocacy specialist Kelly Charleba, so I hope I can do it uh, justice. You can move back. Oh. Oh, there we go. Perfect. So the AEG team takes a proactive role in engaging with policymakers and stakeholders across key legislative areas that affect Alberta businesses. We want to ensure that we emphasize the importance of economic growth and ease of doing business in our advocacy efforts, some of which are listed on the screen. As an example, AEG, in partnership with ICBA, who is also an AEG member, intervened at the Supreme Court level and presented an opposition to Bill C-69, the Canadian Energy Regulatory Act, better known as the No Pipeline Bill. This included written submissions to the Government of Canada and hiring and working with a law firm that assisted with the Supreme Court intervention. Next slide. 
In addition to advocacy, I want to highlight the ongoing government relations activities, including securing Premier Smith for Hello? Oh, there we go. Hello? <laughs> All right, we're back in business here. <laughs> Including securing Premier Smith for an Atchison event on September 9th. Okay, there we go. Hello? <laughs> this is an opportunity for AEG members, along with our co-host, the Atchison Business Association, to host the Premier for an overview of the Atchison Business Park, followed by luncheon, a presentation, and Q&A. We will also be scheduling regular meetings with Chiefs of Staff and Deputy Ministers with our AEG members. These are important discussions which provide continued access to influential decision makers, facilitating ongoing dialogue and allowing for the timely expression of member concerns and feedback. These events provide members with a platform to directly communicate with policy members, policy makers, similar to today's forum, enhancing the impact of their concerns and more importantly, allowing decision makers to seek input from the business community. AEG recently submitted an urgent request to present AEG's petition to the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister. This initiative involved presenting a critical petition on behalf of AEG and its members regarding the recent changes to the capital gains taxation policy. The AEG team, in collaboration with Dr. Tammy Nemeth, successfully coordinated the hand delivery of the petition by MP John Barlow to both Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Deputy Minister Friedland. This action demonstrates AEG's commitment to addressing urgent issues in a timely manner and ensuring that the voices of Alberta businesses are heard at the highest levels. In addition, we recently brought to AEG members' attention the urgent need to understand and respond to the Canadian Sustainability Standards Board proposed standards for climate-related financial disclosure. AEG very quickly organized an awareness campaign, working group sessions, and brought CSSB officials and board members together with our AEG members. These types of engagements ensure that government policies we advocate for are dealt with in a timely manner. It reflects AEG's commitment to balanced and informed advocacy, <coughs> contributing to the development of policies that support economic objectives and showcase Alberta. Next slide, or, yeah. Well, there we go. Our government, as I mentioned earlier, the government efforts are led by Kelly Charlebois, whose contact, deals you, contact details you can find up there on the screen. And he is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> now we'll go to member spotlight. Today's member spotlight is from a company called Pure Life Carbon, who many of you may or may not know. Pure Life Carbon is revolutionizing the substrate market for indoor growing. At Prairie Vertical Farms, we have known the team at Pure Life Carbon for many years and have followed their success in helping increase yields and reduce environmental impact for both greenhouse and indoor growers. As you will hear in the following video, Pure Life Carbon's charged carbon is a revolutionary, reusable, and sustainable growing medium. It outperforms current substrates, replaces over 80% of the harmful ones, it's cost effective, carbon negative, and available in multiple forms, making it a game changer for controlled environment agriculture. So on that note, let's hear directly from Pure Life Carbon.
It's live. It's live. <laughs> take five. Good e evening, everyone. On behalf of the County of Grand Prairie, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all who, of you and express our gratitude up to Alberta Enterprise Group for hosting this event in our county. Events like this are vital in bringing our business community together, fostering collaboration, sharing valuable information, and connecting key decision makers. Your presence here tonight highlights the importance of our collective efforts in driving economic growth and innovation within our region. Now it's my distinct honour to introduce our esteemed guest, the Honourable Minister R.J. Sigurdsson. Minister Sigurdsson was first elected as MLA for Highwood in 2019 and was re-elected in May of 2023. He grew up working on his family farm north of Cochrane. He also has experience in oil and gas, beginning with conventional drilling, later becoming an experienced red seal sheet metal worker and a senior project manager and shareholder for Avalanche Air Systems. Following his re-election, Mr. Sigurdsson has, was sworn in as, in as Alberta's Minister of Agriculture and Irrigation ever, after previously serving as the Parliamentary Secretary for EMS Reform. Please join me in welcoming Minister R.J. Sigurdsson. Appreciate it. 
Well, good evening, everyone, uh, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure to be here and bring greetings on behalf of Premier Smith and my legislative colleagues with the Government of Alberta. And I also want to thank the Alberta Enterprise Group for hosting this event. Um, I appreciate all the effort that you go to to put on events like this. It's a great opportunity for me to be able to uh, come up here to Northern Alberta and meet people, have conversations, and discuss some of the issues that are currently going on within our province. I'm also very delighted uh, afterwards to be able to share my thoughts, uh, listen to any concerns that you may have and answer a few questions. Uh, this is why I came up to Alberta and I'm currently doing a, a Northern Alberta tour. Uh, we are a very diverse uh, province and we understand that there's unique challenges across this province, but we also have a common goal of continuing to grow our economy and grow agriculture agriculture within our province. Now, of course, we have so much to be proud about in this beautiful province, and it starts with generations of the best farmers and ranchers in the world. And it's because of their hard work that we now have within the province of Alberta, half of Canada's barley and nearly a third of the country's wheat and canola. And last year, for the first time, we grew considerably more potatoes than PEI, contributing more than $2 billion to Alberta's economy. Now, this didn't go over very well when I was down in New Brunswick at a federal provincial territorial, but it is a testament to the growth we're seeing and the interest in Alberta agriculture. Now, when it comes to honey, probably something very near and dear to this area, Alberta is now the honey capital of our nation, producing 40% of Canada's total in 2023 and surpassing 100 million in value for the first time last year. A less known fact is bison. Alberta leads the nation for the most bison producers and the most farm bison at more than 65,000 head. And of course, Beef is Alberta's uh, largest agri-food export, with 3.9 billion in exports in 2023. Alberta is Canada's largest cattle producing province. As of July 2023, we had an estimated 5.26 million head. Isn't it crazy that we have more cattle than people in our province? Now, Alberta's ag industry has continued to grow and set records in every sphere. As well in 2023, Alberta's agri-food exports reached a record high of 17.9 billion, accounting for about 20% of Canada's total agri-food exports. Now these are some incredible success stories for the agri-food businesses and their producers here in the province. Agriculture, in addition to being a solid building block of so many of our businesses in our communities, it's a key contributor to our economic strength. Now, thanks to the hard work and dedication of the people in Grand Prairie County, its surrounding areas and across the province, ag brings in billions of dollars every year, and it's steadily growing. Which is why the government's goal right now is to continue to support growth where we can and assist our farmers, processors, businesses, and rural communities to grow and thrive. Now, Alberta's economic development and rural Alberta plan is guiding innovation and growth in our rural communities. Our government listened when rural Albertans and Indigenous communities provided ideas for the plan, including ways to deal with the unique challenges that they face. The plan includes strategies and, action, and actions to make sure rural Albertans and Indigenous communities have economic opportunities where they live. To support the plan, government launched the Small Community Opportunity Program for projects that tackle challenges and tap into opportunities in rural areas. Today, I was pleased to announce more than 3.2 million in grants for 43 community-led local projects to nonprofits, indigenous, and small communities across the province. The program awarded grants between 20,000 to 100,000 across Alberta to support develop, developing those local economies. Some of the Northern Alberta communities and nonprofits receiving grants are Loon River First Nation, Village of Hines Creek, County of Minburn, La Crete Area Chamber of 
Commerce, Mackenzie County, Le Consul Development Economic de Alberta. I do not speak French, and that was very apparent in that statement. And many more, you'll find them listed on alberta.ca. By building capacity in small businesses and the agricultural industry, these rural communities will have a solid foundation to thrive. The fact is when rural communities succeed, all of Alberta is made stronger. We're taking a whole government approach to economic development within our province, especially in rural communities across Alberta. And we're doing that through actions in tourism, broadband healthcare, skills development, job creation, business supports, and infrastructure investment. Now this is evident through last year's 2024 budget within my ministry with supports for agriculture and food industry and rural communities. The budget reflects Alberta's commitment to our, promise, our province's farmers and ranchers and everyone else working hard to put the best food on the plates here at home and across the world. An important link to thriving rural communities are Alberta's ag societies. They contribute to rural Alberta's quality of life, providing educational programs, events, volunteer opportunities, services, and facilities, much like the one that we're in right now, and other facilities that had such a great opportunity to tour today out here. Now across the province, 291 ag societies own or operate over 900 essential community facilities, like curling and hockey rinks, rodeo grounds, and so much more. Every year, ag societies put on or host more than 37,000 activities with more than 2.3 million people taking part in those activities. To support their work through our budget, we provided stable funding of $11.5 million for the Ag Society's grant program to ensure Ag Societies can continue to help their communities grow and thrive. And, la and we also announced $2.5 million for the Ag Society's infrastructure revitalization program to support major repairs at Ag Society facilities. Last year, that program funded over 34 projects across Alberta, including the following so uh, societies in Grand Prairie and County. And the Grand Prairie Regional Ag and Exhibition Society received funds to update their fire suppression system in their building, and Saskatoon Lake Ag Society to make their hall wheelchair accessible and upgrade their commercial kitchen. Now, I'd like to also touch on some additional government supports for the egg industry. Now farming, of course, we all know is a struggle at the best of times, and our government continues to support agriculture finances, services, corporation, AFSC, of course, and we're committed to always providing stable business risk management and insurance supports now and in the future which is why through our budget we allocated 466.1 million of provincial dollars for AFSC. Now this is an increase of 47.4 million over the last year. And I encourage all producers to take advantage of business risk management programs that work for them and their farms. Now, AFSC, of course, has plenty of programs that offer more than just peace of mind, and that includes annual crop insurance, straight hail insurance, agri-stability, and livestock price insurance for purchase price protection. Of course, First Nations as well, I want to state, their producers are also eligible um, for all of any of the range of business risk management programs that AFSC provides. Now through AFSC, Alberta producers have accessing as well to financing rates that are usually lower than any other available source of debt financing with favorable terms and long amortization periods. Now AFSC continually w looks for more modern ways of doing their work and that's why last year we announced 900,000 towards drone services to make assessing and paying out wildlife damage claims easier and quicker. Now when it comes to Alberta's economic development, I believe agriculture is fundamental and it really is the foundation of our province. It's helping to drive growth and diversification throughout our province and our agri-food sector employs thousands of Albertans, attracts international investment and exports products to markets all over the world. Our go government plans 
on accelerating this momentum and supporting in every way we can. And before I close, I'd like to touch on a few things Alberta's government is doing to keep the ag sector strong. We have one of the most competitive tax regimes in all of Canada. We've also been creating programs to attract investment, grow the industry and create more jobs. In 23, 2023, we created the Agri-Processing Investment Tax Credit Program to attract large-scale investment in value-added manufacturing. Through the program, we provide a 12% non-refundable tax credit to eligible capital expenditures to corporations that invest $10 million in value-added agricultural processing. Another program that has been adding value to agriculture for some time is the Sustainable Canadian Ag Partnership. This five-year, $508 million pro, uh, federal provincial program supports the industry pro by providing funding for projects that improve operations, expand markets, and create jobs here in Alberta. Alberta's government also provides specialized concierge services to support companies to figuring out funding options, navigate regulatory requirements, and connect with partners, enter new markets, attract investment, and expand their sales in existing markets. To support some of these services, we have a network of agricultural force uh, focus staff in Tokyo, Beijing, Seoul, Mexico City, Minneapolis, Dusseldorf, and Singapore. And like I said, we really do want to keep this momentum going. Right now in the province of Alberta, over three years, up to 2023, we saw just over $2 billion of investment. This year, we're probably going to surpass that in just one year. This really has become the province a beacon of where people want to invest in agro-processing and agriculture as a whole. And it's because of the hard work like individuals like yourselves in this room here today that continue to aid that work and it's going to be essential for the success of the agricultural industry moving forward to continue to secure food security and food affordability and to support our farmers and ranchers. Once again, I just want to thank you for having me here today and I, I look forward to answering some of your questions. Cheers. Sure. Do I take this? <laughs> um, in, in one moment. <laughs> um, just as we do a quick stage shift, uh, I will just say that we've got a few questions that were already submitted from members and guests that will be asked first, uh, and then actually some members that couldn't be in the room, but um, we'll do that first, and then we're going to take some questions from the floor. So if you happen to have questions, there's paper and pen in front of you. Please write the question, put up your hand, and let me know when you have it, and I'll come by and pick it up and make sure that Sean gets it for the question time, okay? Now we'll see if both of these work. Give it a shot. Go, Minister. Thank you. you that happy? Testing. Testing. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Give a little distance. Okay, I think we're ready to go. So first of all, I do want to thank you again, Minister Sigurdsson, for joining. It, it really is a great opportunity to be able to ask questions and get your feedback on some stuff. So it, it, it's very much appreciated. Thank you. So as I said, I, we do have a couple questions that were submitted, but happy to take questions from the floor. Um, firstly, some of these almost seem like they're dissertations, but I assure you there's a question embedded in here. <laughs> you have been vocal about your concerns regarding the newly announced U.S. product labeling rule, which could disrupt the highly integrated meat and livestock supply chains between Canada and the U.S. Can you elaborate on the specific strategies and actions you are taking to address this issue? Also, how has the federal government supported, or not, Alberta's efforts to ensure that these new labeling regulations do not negatively impact our trade relationships and competitiveness of our livestock and meat industries? 
Well, thank you for the question. Of course, uh, we see voluntary country of origin labeling uh, being announced in the U.S. And of course, it was a deep concern to us, understanding the impact of what happened in Alberta under the mandatory country of origin labeling. A billion dollars impact that happened to our industry under that. Of course, uh, there was a challenge to that that we won as, as a country and were awarded billions of dollars for that. Now they've gone and made it voluntary, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of a workaround to it. And of course, we've been advocating, we've sent uh, letters, we've been making, uh, working with our U.S. counterparts to make sure that they understand our concerns and the impact to this. I think one thing that I do want to share is that uh, we get a chance every year as uh, Ag Ministers to go to the Tri-National Accord, uh, where there's U.S. representatives there and, of course, Canadian representatives. And it was interesting to see that uh, our, our, you know, a lot of the uh, uh, northern states, the beef producers there were against this as well. Mm -hmm. They understand that we're stronger together oh. and, and they really were not supportive of it. One thing that I would say about it was we, we expressed our concerns strongly at that time to reconsider that they did not do this. Uh, of course the announcement was made, they went uh, ahead with us now. On One thing I would say is the manner in which they've implemented this, the cost of producers in the U.S. is, is extensive. Mm -hmm. and and the infrastructure they would have to set up to follow through with that is also a big challenge for them and is going to equate to a cost. Um, do I think there's going to be a high participation? I don't. I think it's really going to be a niche producers in the U.S. that m maybe take part in this. Um, we've heard and talked to our, our packers, producers that operate on both sides of the border. They kind of feel the same way, but we, we are concerned about this. I don't think this is the right path forward for both food security security and food affordability, I think we're, we're stronger together when we continue to take down barriers and make sure that we have our farmers and ranchers have access to trade on both sides and we clear that, but we are monitoring it. We will be bringing it up again at Trinational this year with our U.S. Par our partners and expressing our deep concerns about this and, and mm -hmm. hopefully getting them to reconsider that. Well, it's a worthy fight, I'll tell you, because voluntary turns into mandatory very quickly and you're blazing the trail on this because we're facing the same issue in both agriculture and other industries on plastic registry and also on the CSSB sustainability to disclosure standards. So we're all watching what's going on there because our big fear is voluntary turns into mandatory very quickly and it, and it hurts the smaller business folks. Oh, what I would say is uh, because they lost the core challenge under mm -hmm. mandatory, I cannot see them going that direction again, of course, because uh, that would be challenging under the current uh, trade uh, negotiations that we have in place federally. Uh, but of course, Kuzma always comes up for renegotiation <laughs> and uh, I, we all will continue to work with our federal counterparts to make sure that that isn't possible again. I, I think uh, even the pressure they're getting from their own producers that are just south of the border uh, will hopefully prevent that from happening. Excellent. Thank you for that. Really appreciate it. Um, second question. In February 2024, Saudi Arabia exported fresh tomatoes to Europe from its indoor farming operations. Given the critical issues of water security and food security, how could Alberta secure a future in indoor agriculture, particularly for vegetables and leafy greens, which we currently don't grow? And what steps would you see if we were gonna do that to, to um, leverage Alberta's stable and abundant energy resources to support such an effort, such as Saudi Arabia, you know, using that Saudi Arabia model as a template? Well, the interesting part about that is as we see the technology continue to advance in vertical farming, we see a lot more opportunities that are happening right here in the province of Alberta. It was funny that you had the Pure Life Carbon as your sponsor because many of uh, those shots in that video, I, I, I was standing there and uh, it resonated right away when it came up. I said, yeah, I, I, I've seen um, of that product and being used for tomatoes mm -hmm. and strawberries. It was very interesting to see. Now, we're seeing an acceleration in interest in vertical farming here in the province of Alberta already, and a lot of that is really because we have that low-tax jurisdiction, no PST, and um, we're already seeing that. Now, of course, um, is that good enough? Maybe not. 
Um, and that's why we continue to review that as a department and look at opportunities for us to be able to accelerate that type mm -hmm. of investment here in the province of Alberta. Um, I got to be able to tour Goodleaf, the announcement in Calgary, uh, the technology they're using, the fact that they can actually grow a head of lettuce in eight days is just absolutely mm -hmm. incredible. And what they're doing with the technology to make it actually uh, profitable mm -hmm. here in the province of Alberta is incredible. But we always look at opportunities to look at uh, how we can continue to um, improve the environment to get more investment like that uh, within the province of Alberta, mm -hmm. and that's why we have our AgriInvest team working every day on projects just like that. Excellent, thanks. Now I want to switch for a second to the agri-food tax credit. Now, it was introduced, of course, to accelerate international and domestic business attraction and investment. What specific actions has your department taken to promote the tax credit, and what measurable outcomes have you seen in terms of business attraction and investment since the implementation? Well, this is a great question, and one of the things I, I think we can be very proud of uh, in the province of Alberta is we are that beacon for investment right now. We talk about the fact that in a matter of three years, our Agri-Invest team managed to bring in uh, just over $2 billion in investment and create thousands of jobs. And when we look at the announcements already that I've made just this year, we will surpass that in one year. <laughs> and this is uh, a lot of those businesses that we're working uh, with right now say that the investment tax credit combined with all the other advantages in Alberta is the reason they're mm -hmm. moving forward on these type of investments right now. And it's not a small amount, 12% non-refundable. And don't get me wrong, that business has to be profitable to ensure we're getting revenue from that. But I mean, that's a substantial yeah. and it's really accelerating that investment. And the reason we have those international offices is a communication tool that we utilize to be able to spread the me message internationally. And really within the business community uh, because we're making those huge announcements like the recent one for the renewable diesel mm -hmm. with Imperial Oil, that that message is spreading really, really fast. And we're seeing a, a, just a momentum that continues to accelerate more and more of these types of investments that are coming here. We have many more to announce this year alone, and a lot of them are really going to be to the benefit of our, our producers, mm -hmm. our farmers and ranchers. These yeah, are great. Primary producers. Primary yeah. producers, these are great announcements for them uh, because they have either A, more access to processing or they have more access to air avenues in which they can sell their, their commodity at potentially higher than, than global, global mm -hmm. values. Yeah, excellent. So successful. 12% tax credit. Very, Very successful. Awesome. That's great. I'll do one more and then I'll take a question from the floor. Yeah. One of the significant challenges Alberta livestock producers face is the regulatory inconsistencies and differing inspection standards across provinces, which hinder the smooth trade of meat products and livestock within Canada. Can you provide an update on the progress of any initiatives aimed at reducing these interprovincial trade barriers and share any measurable impacts that you have seen on Alberta's agricultural sector so far? It's definitely a challenge and something we've highlighted uh, that it's interesting that we hear from a lot of individuals that it's easier to trade north-south or down to the U.S. than it is east-west, which is just, it, it's crazy to me to even think that that is the current situation of where we're at in Canada. And that's why uh, we moved forward with the Lloyd Minster pilot. Mm -hmm. We've heard a lot of positivity that's been coming back off that. And when we get that report back and we're going to start doing some pre-work and taking a look at and and trying to see at what the signals are where the benefits are and really spread that message I mean this is a key component that I've been saying over and over again these barriers these barriers to trade don't benefit anybody mm -hmm. it doesn't benefit the consumer it doesn't benefit the producer it this is where we have to start moving forward with this and getting participation on the federal level working with CFIA to be able to tear down these barriers so that we we can open up our markets within our own country that is to the benefit to everyone. And my assumption is that 
these are just legacy barriers. Like if, when you talk to your Saskatchewan counterpart, Manitoba, BC, and Ontario, they're as probably as frustrated as you are. Is that safe to say? They're as frustrated as I am, but I think it's actually a mindset. Uh -huh. In a lot of cases, I think a lot of this came out of the, the politicians or they were thought they were creating a regulatory regime that was protecting an industry within their province. But what we're seeing through these pilots is it isn't protecting anything. It's hindering us province to province. And if we start pulling down those barriers, it becomes a net benefit to, like I said, to consumers and producers. Mm -hmm. And that's the mindset we have to shift, both as, as elected officials, but also making sure that those producers understand that sometimes they get a little bit of, of fearful of saying, oh, oh my Lord, you're mm -hmm. going to open it up and now i got to compete against Alberta. The reality is in, in most of the research that we're seeing and within the pilot right now, is that it really is a benefit on both sides. And yeah. that's that's where we're going to take that report and really look at next steps on how we accelerate continuing to work with our, our provincial partners to be able to increase trade east and west. Yeah, well done. That's a long time coming, so good luck with that. All right, a couple questions, a couple questions from the floor. Thanks very much for continued support of the Sustainable Ag Partnership. Question. Will there be opportunities in the future to support capital spending of projects under one million? Ten million is a lot and out of touch for some small processors. Yeah, I think one of the things that uh, we should always do is review programs. And um, I, I get very proud and I rave about the agro-processing investment tax credit because it is having a massive impact. But we also have to identify those gaps and where we can do program improvements. And uh, year over year, um, at, we're going to continue to take a look at that program and small changes that we can make oh, okay. that will continue to improve that. And we have understand I've heard that. Uh, we, I've heard that loud and clear, and we're going to take a look at those chances in the future to be able to, how do we strengthen this program if it's, it's working, we see it working, and of course, any incremental changes that we can make to it that are going to make it better, we're always going to take that away, look at it, and see if we can implement that. Yeah, it, it's a brilliant policy, you know, the 12% tax credit, but you don't get it till you make money. Well, it's a challenge that you as a business owner should, you know, take on. Yep, so well done. Alrighty, next up, another question from the floor. Will there be any incentives for value-added enterprises in Northern Alberta? For example, packaging plants as it would be safer to transport packaged meat rather than live animals on our very busy highways. This is a, a strategy that we definitely need to think about, and this is where and why I'm doing this Northern Alberta tour. I mean, when you look at Alberta, there's unique challenges, but also a lot of unique opportunities that exist, and actually getting your feet on the ground and being able to talk to producers, ag societies, uh, municipalities, and and really getting out into the community and seeing the opportunities that are presented. Um, this was a conversation that I had earlier today about the potential of what it would mean to have that here in northern Alberta, and also what can we do to help accelerate getting that type of investment here, understanding how much of a positive impact it would have on the area. So we have to have that uh, collaborative strategy when we look at the province, and I task my Agri-Invest team to make sure that they're looking at certain areas within the province and not focusing just on one area or large metro centres. I want to see these investments happen and happen in rural Alberta. It's a part of rural revitalization. It creates those high paying jobs which helps build communities in rural Alberta. So we definitely have heard from uh, municipal representatives, producers here that this would be a benefit and that's something we're going to take away and go back and work on and see what we can do to help out in that area. So they've been the commute. Oh, I think I shut off. Ben. Hello, there we go. So the community's been very willing and giving with their ideas and how they today. Well, I'll say it flat out. Every time I go to an event where the 4x4 diesel trucks outnumber the cars <laughs> by about 20 to 1, I get very honest opinions about what we should be doing as a government. And I appreciate that. I do. 
All righty. Well, one question here on advocacy that uh, that I had is, you've been tasked with advocating on behalf of Alberta farmers and ranchers by promoting agriculture and pushing back against policies from other jurisdictions that hinder the sector. Can you share some specific examples of your re recent advocacy efforts and the tangible results that they have yielded for Alberta's agricultural community? Yes, and I'm going to try not to be too partisan or political on this one. <laughs> I think you're um, safe. Okay. Well, that truck ratio might save me here. Um, <laughs> when, when I was first appointed as, as the minister, of course, the premier and I had a very lengthy discussion about just this and actually is what is, uh, what is going on um, here at home. Um, federally and as well around the world and and of course we see some signs that are deeply concerning um, when you put ideology ahead of food security and food affordability the impact is something that um, really hits home at the kitchen table every single night and moves people closer and closer to food poverty. So this is really the message that I've been trying to bring. Now when I was first appointed Minister of Agriculture, of course, federal, provincial, territorial meetings happen once a year. Uh, we went down. Uh, my team, I have an incredible team uh, that prepped me in all the areas that, of course, and brought me up to speed very quickly on a lot of the areas the federal government is moving with initiatives that are going to have a very negative impact on our mm -hmm. agriculture and agro-processing industry. Yeah. And of course, at that first meeting, um, I, I probably got a little hot behind the microphone, um, but because of that, we did get a working group uh, to take a look at the changes um, and a lot of what's going on with PMRA. Uh, we did get the, they did finish that work. They came with recommendations, what I think reasonable are reasonable recommendation. Now it's about holding this year at a federal provincial, territorial, and Yellowknife that's coming up very quickly, holding the federal government's feet to the fire to make sure that they start moving on some of those changes. There's a lot of other areas. We can talk about C234, how it's been yeah. hung up in the Senate. Late changes were made. We met with the senator, both our Alberta senator here, that was a part of that, uh, expressed our displeasure, really had a focused uh, a meeting with her to, to really say, listen, you, this is... Uh, it's not where I want to be on a carbon tax exemption. I'd like to see the entire country yep, be carbon yep. tax exempt. For sure. Um, but it would have been nice if that would have been passed right now, providing some relief to our farmers and li uh, ranchers. The plastics ban, what it means for processing, packing, what it means for food security. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things we continue to push on, and uh, we're being as forward and as frank as possible, yeah. and um, getting that federal cooperation sometimes is not easy, um, but we're not gonna give up. This is something we can't give up on. It's far too important. It's too important to our farmers, and it's too important to the people at home that are going into grocery stores right now paying that high price for food. Yeah, there's uh, certainly lots of bullets flying your way, so thank you very much for all the effort. I can duck, dive, dodge. <laughs> uh, Alrighty, another question from the floor. Uh, would you expand on the importance of supporting youth, um, I think something in agriculture as a career path, similar to... Yeah. Uh, the Sampling Apprentice Program and other skilled trades. Absolutely. Um, this, this is something that I actually think, and I, I love this question, because I actually think this is where we need to drive mm -hmm. down to the heart too. Um, most kids right now are two generations away from a family farm, yep. and they have no idea where their food comes from. They have no idea how it's produced. And really, if we can look at additional ways, uh, we've got to bring more common sense um, pieces related to agriculture into our K-12 curriculum. We have to continue to take a look at some of our programs that we have for high school, uh, dual credit, green cert program, review those, provide better pathways into a career in agriculture. Um, we've had conversations as well with uh, individuals talking about practical ranching schools and all those possibilities. These are key and we're looking at strategies right now and I actually think some of these are actually going to come to fruition mm. quickly mm -hmm. and I think you will see some changes um, none of which I can announce today yeah, yeah, but enough. there's work happening right now on being able to put those pieces in place uh, to be able to um, 
educate uh, at a, ver a very early age, starting within our K-12 curriculum to tell the, the real story right. about agriculture, which I think will help us in the future, but also I think that opens uh, door doors for those children to recognize that there's a lot of high paying, very satisfying jobs uh, in agriculture, and I think that's gonna be critical moving forward in the future. Yeah, I'm from that part of the world. I'm a, from a small town and I wouldn't have given it up. It was a great way to grow up. So the more kids that can experience that, the better. In recent years, aerial applications at crop, the, and crop spraying has become more in Northern Alberta. In Northern Alberta. With the Alberta Aviation Skills Grant, the provincial government has has provided grants for skilled aviation training. Are there any incentives, are there any additional incentives for farmers to utilize in aerial applications rather than traditional ground spraying to further grow their crops here in Alberta? None that I know of right now, but whoever asked this question would make my best friend Baron, who runs uh, a company doing air spraying would be very happy with that <laughs> question. Um, but, uh, no, I'm, I'm unaware of any uh, direct incentives uh, that would incentivize that right now. Um, of course, we want to continue to support and, and strengthen uh, our aviation field across the, uh, the board. That one of our, uh, in our previous um, four years, it was actually uh, um, MLA Godfrey that actually oh, created the yeah. strategic um, Aviation Advisory Council too, working yep. on additional strategies to support the aviation sector, which applies to everything, including making sure that there's airfields and everything going on with that. But uh, the actual answer is I'm unaware of any. I'll take that away as something we can look at and uh, continue to make sure that that is something available because it is, it's a critical uh, resource for those farms. Yeah, sure is, lots of moving parts. Fine. Um, I have two more questions, is that, Okay, I, I want to touch a bit. This is something that AEG got very active in in the last little while. The see the, the Canadian, the Canadian, the Canadian Sustainability Standard Board, and the recommendations they're making, as, <laughs> and the recommendations that they're making. Try this. <laughs> we'll, we'll share. <laughs> Um, of course, farmers across Europe have pushed back against these regulations for a thousand reasons, affordability, cost of compliance, uh, potential burdens, and we've seen a lot of protests in, in Europe. It's been well publicized. Um, I, I'm not sure how much thought you know, has been given to it, because again, it's voluntary for now, but how do you plan to address these concerns and advocate for Alberta farmers to ensure that, you know, any of the new standards, you know, do not unduly burden and make us uncompetitive with our main trading partners like US, Asia, and Mexico? Well, I think this, I mean, it's very concerning. Like you said, it always starts voluntary and it moves to something more down the road. So it definitely gives you a signal on, on what's kind of coming. And we've, you know, I've seen a lot of what's happening uh, internationally and it does concern me. Um, I think one thing that we need to do to start off with is we need to tell the Alberta story better. I think that's number one. I think we need to sit down and, and just recently, I sent out a later letter to stakeholders uh, producers, agencies, boards, commissions, uh, to really provide information to me so we can build a story about what actually is happening in Alberta and actually um, tell the story in the right manner. Mm -hmm. I think that's one key yeah. because like I said, the education piece is a huge part of it. I talk to individuals and I, this is about the simplest way to explain it. I still think they believe there's a farmer in an open cap tractor with a, a trailer behind with a guy with a shovel just hucking out fertilizer into a field <laughs> with a stream running through it. And they're like, well, why wouldn't you want them to reduce fertilizer usage by 30%? And this is what we're up against yeah. a bit on that end right. of it. So it's first about really collecting that knowledge and, and really be able to compile that. And uh, I also challenge industry as well uh, to come together as a whole, mm -hmm. uh, to work together on this one. But of course, I, as the Ag Minister, I want to lead on this and really pull it together to be able to tell that. I've started actually holding some of my meetings with all the agencies 
agencies, boards, commissions, so that they start understanding that they have a lot of, in common with some of those challenges. So it's about telling that story, but it's also about remembering that once we get that, communicating it well, and remembering that, um, I mean, it's reading my mandate letter, that we do need to push back. Mm -hmm. We do need to do better. Yep. We do have to understand that, and I equate it to this way, um, some of the countries, when you go and you t discuss with those farmers, they didn't get to that breaking point in one large step. It was inch by inch. So unfortunately, I know it always seems, and, and, the, and the media wants to approach it like, well, it's just the ag ministers fighting back, just yeah. picking a fight, picking a fight. The reality is it's a frog in the pod theory. It's an inch by inch, yeah. that's how we got here. So right now it's about, we refuse to give up an inch if we know it's not to the benefit of our farmers and ranchers, if it isn't improving um, how we do things, sustainability, we have to use common sense and reason when I have the conversation you consider that less than 1% of individuals raise all the food Canada is only one of six countries that's a net exporter right now yeah and when I sit down and I talk about sustainability when I talk about uh, improvement in farming and I talk about uh, innovation and investment in technology you know the one thing that prevents farmers from doing that is if they can't feed their family and they yeah. can't be profitable. That's where you can't put ideology ahead. I've said the number one thing we have to do is make sure our farmers and ranchers are profitable. They are already true stewards of the land. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where they generate all their income from. They care for that land. They want to pass it on to their, their sons, their daughters, and they want it to be in better shape than when they got it. So of course they're going to innovate. Of course they're going to move to more sustainable practices. And we need to stop, and, we, and I keep saying to the federal government, stop ruling with a stick and start leading with a carrot. Yeah. Our farmers and ranchers were already headed down this path. They've been innovators in sustainability in, in investment in technology and new farming practices that makes for, uh, that protects our environment and, you know, generates better soil quality, health, everything. So stop trying to regulate them into non-profitability. They're yeah. on a global scale. They're price takers, not price makers. Mm -hmm. So we have to find a way to work with them to be profitable. And when you do that, you see them innovate, invest in new technology and it moves forward with, um, the, it really moves the sustainable farming forward faster than the current, um, what I would think is the current movement that we're seeing. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. The industry, at least from what I've seen, we're actually doing it quicker than regulation is giving us credit for. And all regulation is going to do is just put a monkey wrench into everything. So I have one last question and then you can, um, you know, just trail into some closing comments. Obviously, there's, there's a lot of people in this room, some primary producers, some secondary producers, some administrators, uh, you know, pillars of the community here. And, and this, isn't, this isn't about us saying to, you know, you and your team, you have to do this. But the, my question is, what do you need from us? Like, what do you, what would you like, uh, what would you like to see from all the people in this room tomorrow and the next day to help you do your job better? Well, first of all, I want to thank Alberta Enterprise and, and everybody that actually showed up here tonight because when you ask about what we can do better, well, the people in this room are, are doing it right now. This is what we need to do more of, is work collaboratively together between uh, producers, processors and government and make sure that we understand um, the challenges that may, this area may face that's unique to other areas of the province. Um, I think the one thing I would ask is, I may be the Minister of Agriculture, but never be afraid to send an email. Never be afraid to send a suggestion. Never be afraid to take a look and provide some constructive criticism to something, uh, a program or whatever that we're providing. Uh, this is something I come from, of course, I grew up on a farm, then on to oil and gas, you know, came back, became a tradesperson, Red Seal, and a business owner. Well, it's a very long story of how I got into politics, but, and we don't have time for that, but I, 
I think when, when I think about that whole process when I was in business, the number one thing was connecting and understanding that we have to hear it from everyone along that whole chain to be able to get it right. And nobody should be afraid of constructive criticism and looking and reviewing programs to make changes that are gonna to be to the benefit to everybody. So if there is suggestions, reach out. If you, my, my department will always take a look at those emails and, and really try to figure out what we're doing right and if there is that constructive criticism, how we can take a look at those programs and make them better for the future. Awesome, thank you. I can't thank you enough for, I can't thank you enough for being here. This was, uh, you know, I really appreciate it and I know everyone in the room does. So on that note, I'm gonna invite you to stay up here and I'm gonna call Catherine back to the stage. Thank you guys. And actually you both stay. <laughs> uh, now we'll hear from our friend Heather at Alberta Council with official thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I just, first of all, I wanted to say thank you so much to Minister Sigerson for making the time in your busy schedule to come to this part of the province and just take the time to actually meet, um, and meet with your son, people about, <laughs> about their issues, handing microphones, you know, he, he really does it all. Um, thank you so much for coming today. And I wanted to thank uh, Shondell as well for moderating. So we have a gift for you, both of you. <laughs> So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, but there's also another gift that we want to give to Minister Sigerson as well. So it's our honor to present from you from AG. In particular, it, this is a bound copy of the transfer to our province of its natural resources from the federal government in 1926. Minister, I know that you and Premier Smith and your colleagues uh, here in the room uh, and across the province continue to defend our provincial rights and jurisdiction with Ottawa. And AG member Stephen Galban has donated a copy to each minister who speaks at AG. A copy to remind them of the important work that you do. Thank you so much. Also, thank you to the room, uh, the county and the MD and everyone who's here tonight. I know the Oilers are playing, so thank you all for making a time to come out. I'm affording this conversation. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. 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 Thank you